and sacrificial. Um, brought to you today by I Am Green, San Diego River Valley Conservancy, uh, and San Diego Gas and Electric Company and Fat Crops. I would like to begin today's um, workshop actually with a brief um, icebreaker. So I'm going to go through the names that I see um, as I see them on the board. And then if you can just introduce yourself and tell us what your favorite thing to grow. Um, and I'll start. My name is Sarteta and I love to grow bananas. Um, and then if I can have Cheryl. Hi, I'm Cheryl. My husband Richard is here and we love to grow tomatoes. Oh, grapes. Oh, okay. and uh, sorry, grapes for, from our vineyard. Forgot about that. Nice. <laughs> That's beautiful, vineyard. Um, if we can have Phyllis. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, well, I'm trying to put in some native plants right now. And that's my thing. Nice. All right, uh, let's see, Deborah. Can I unmute? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Debbie and I am a member of the Poway Valley Garden Club. My gardening lately has gone downhill dramatically. So I'm very interested in hearing what you guys have to say about companion plants. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, also, if you don't wanna come on, like unmute yourself to say, you can always put it in the chat, that's okay. Um, we have Vicki. Uh, hi, I um, like to grow everything I like to eat. That's a great answer. Um, we have here, up oh, I see uh, Laura. Skipped over Gary for a second, my apologies. Hi, this is Laura and my husband is sitting here with me and we both love to grow vegetables and he likes to grow flowers like snapdragons and stuff, petunias and stuff like that, that we can- Beautiful. Yeah. Pollinators. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. We have Gary. Hi. <clears throat> yes, I like to grow all sorts of vegetables myself right now working on the, the winter crops. Beautiful. Let's see, I have Teresa. Teresa, are you there? If you want to unmute. We also have a couple people sharing in the chat. Uh, let's go on to Barbara. All right, Barbara, if you can unmute. If not, we'll move on to heaven. I know it says Julian. Hi, everyone. I like to grow everything, but my I think my top two favorite things to grow are radishes because they grow super fast. And, um, and corn, because corn is grand. When you grow it, it's super tall and beautiful and fun. Awesome. We'll definitely talk about both of those today, too. Um, we have Kathleen's iPhone. <clears throat> Kathleen, if you can hear us. Hi, I'm uh, Kathleen. I'm actually in a hotel lobby, so forgive the appearance and noise. Um, I'm with the Solana Beach Garden Club, the Seaweeders, and we're working really hard to expand our pollinator habitat. So um, interested in how our backyard gardens can also uh, add to that effort. Um, let's see, we have Joseph with the San Diego. Hi everyone, 
Thanks for coming. Um, I grew up planting plants with my uh, dad and he always had, you know, vegetables and uh, peaches and plums and he even tried watermelons one time. Uh, so I'm starting off in my own transect, trying to do vegetables and then making my way to fruits and then make, I started with succulents actually, because they were obviously a lot easier to plant around. Um, but now I'm moving on to edible fruits or edible foods and uh, there's always techniques and challenges. So I'm happy to be here. Happy everyone's here to learn about all the tips that you can provide and give us. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we have, is it or Carol Lee? Can you hear me? Okay, we'll see Lynette. I have a large vegetable garden and I have had a rotten year with regard to tomatoes and salad greens. Oh, I'm tomatoes and your greens. Mm -hmm. Is it because of the rain maybe? Perhaps. All right. Thank you for sharing that where we perish. Peace. I'm driving at the moment. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite thing to grow right now. Um, I've uh, We've tried some small vegetables. Um, so we've got kale. We've grown some tomatoes. We've tried squash. Um, I haven't done anything consistent, um, but I'm just happy to be here and excited to learn something new today. Thank you for joining us. Is it Mina? Mina. Mina. My and we are growing, let's see, a little bit of this and that Swiss chard right now, cabbage, currently interested in trying to get mangoes and citrus, um, cocktail grapefruit. We're growing Oro Blanco grapes, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. We are, let's see, we have Ben. Yeah, um, I like to grow mostly vegetables, uh, winter and both summer. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so if there's anyone else that really wants to come on to the chat, I mean, on to the um, unmute themselves and introduce what they introduce, introduce themselves and say what they like to grow, feel free to unmute yourself now or you can put it in the chat. I do want to try to get going because I know um, I got a late start today. So my apologies for that. Okay. If you want, you can drop it in the chat. And um, I appreciate y'all for, for working with me in my, in my late, lateness here today. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start this presentation. Um, again, I'm Sartek Nefer. I am um, the creator of Fat Crops, which is providing healthier alternatives to communities reclaiming our people's sustainability. And this is our Zoom workshop on companion planting and sacrificial plants. Um, oh, just a couple of housekeeping things. We did change the entire workshop over to virtual um, just to go ahead and be safe. Um, so we won't be doing high classes. If you haven't already, um, please click on the link that reg to the registration links and add your email address so that we can update you and your mailing address so that we can send it um, at the end of the mini series. And please be sure to check back in for our next workshop, which is um, 99 Problems, But a Pest Ain't One. Um, so just a little look into, this slide actually is just a little look into how my fight for environmental justice um, began. Um, this is me as a baby. Um, I was kind of raised with this environmental framework um, mindset. Um, and then I was involved in an organization that got uh, gifted a plot community garden and from there I kind of shifted my gardening into like full-scale thinking about growing food on a large basis for my community 
From there, I was introduced to Sister Maria Mohammed, who's present today of I Am Green. Um, and through uh, Sister Maria, I became a climate ambassador for environmental justice. Um, and then I was actually connected with Standigita River Valley Conservancy, um, which is how we ended up with this partnership here through the San Diego Gas and Electric um, Environmental Champions Grant. Um, so I was raised with the understanding that everything on this beautiful uh, planet is connected. We must give what we can, take only what we need and be thankful. Um, I think it was my journey into yoga that really had me like re-evaluating the ways that I honor my belief in that um, and the ways that I honor myself, the ways that I honor the earth, the ways that I honor my ancestors and my descendants. Um, so our goal with Fat Crops was to create a food forest in the middle of Southeast San Diego. Um, and that's kind of like my integrated way to address the fight for food justice, and environmental justice while still maintaining this racial justice framework. Um, a food forest, as you see a picture of here, it comprises of seven layers and it pretty much mimics its natural environment, um, allowing for greater diversity of life. So rather than what you see a lot of nowadays, which is like um, monocrop farms where you see perfect little rows of the same crop repeatedly. Sometimes you'll see like a few different types of crops. Um, the idea of a food forest is to integrate everything together so that you have, um, first of all, your stacking functions in space and time, but also you have the biodiversity that uh, a natural ecosystem would have. Um, so just like in nature, some things complement, support, assist, or otherwise provide for others, and some things take away, consume, or somehow hinder others. Companion planting is the intentional planting of plants that provide support and other benefits to nearby plants. I categorize companion planting into four main categories, structural support, soil builders, beneficials, and sacrificials. Please feel free to stop me at any time any questions, or pop it in the chat and we'll answer it as soon as um, we can. So structural support are medium or tall trees and plants that have stalks. They grow vertically, they allow other plants to vine or trellis up them. Additionally, as a structural support, I would like to add cover crops here because they provide structural support in their root systems. They keep small root systems together and they reduce soil runoff and evaporation um, of moisture that's in the soil, which can lead to the desertification of many dry areas. Some trees are also great for providing shade for plants that don't thrive in full sunlight, such as coral bells, which are beautiful fragrant flowers that attract bees and hummingbirds. We'll talk more on those later. Lungwort and alchemia, which um, both have medicinal properties. Of course, you can always build, buy, um, or create um, support systems like cages, stakes, hoops, trellises, fences, etc. And these may be beautiful additions to your garden, but if you're into companion planting, you could get more use of your space producing more than one crop in the, essentially the same spot and your crops will actually grow healthier and more nutritious overall. Some examples of vining or climbing plants include pole beans, peas, tomatoes, grapes, passion fruit, and strawberries. Are there any questions so far? Here in the structural support picture, you'll see some trellises and you'll also see um, on the right-hand side, those pictures are more root crops, their cover crops, and you can see how deep they go into the ground. Um, and that's just an example. So the next uh, category is soil builders or nutrient accumulators. There are many nutrients in the soil that help to make our plants grow, not to mention a host of other microorganisms that both build and consume biomass, which is the total mass of organisms in an area. Am I still sharing? Sorry about that. Some examples of ways to build the soil include planting nitrogen fixing trees, planting carbon sequestering trees, mulching, 
and planting ground covers, which sink moisture into the ground and maintain coolness in the soil. Planting cover crops also helps to break up soil compaction with their extensive root systems while holding the soil together at the same time. One sec, we'll get those slides back up. Sorry about that. A few examples of soil builders include comfrey, which is highly medicinal, stinging nettles, which is both highly nutritious and medicinal, Uh, beans and alfalfa, alfalfa, as well as grains like rye, oats, and wheat. Chop and drop is a process that accumulates biomass as well. I will discuss chop and drop a little more in the slide on sacrificials. You can't. When considering soil, you might hear about NPK, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which can be altered with commercial fertilizers or by adding bone meal, organic compost, human urine, bat guano, crab, and shrimp waste for phosphorus and or wood ash, kelp, seaweed, coffee grounds, and fruit compost, especially bananas, for potassium. Another term you might hear regarding soil nutrients is NFT, or nitrogen-fixing trees and plants, which hold nitrogen into the soil. Some examples of nitrogen-fixing legume trees include moringa, tamarind, pigeon peas, and sea berry, which you see here. You may experience nitrogen toxicity, which can present as extremely dark leaves, burning or browning leaf tips or yellowing leaves. For that, add mulch, sawdust, or wood chips, or plant nitrogen consuming plants like tomatoes, corn, broccoli, spinach, and cabbage. Additionally, carbon is life. Carbon sequestering trees and native plants breathe in carbon dioxide release oxygen into the air and store carbon in the ground, making life possible both above ground and below. Some examples of good tr uh, carbon trees include the California redwoods, silver maple, oaks, and red mulberry. Are there any questions so far? Right. So beneficials, pollinators, parasitoids, and predators. Which of these bugs is the good bug? Anyone, if you want to unmute yourself, you can tell me which of these do you think is the good bug? Can you repeat the terms? Yes. Uh, beneficials, pollinators, parasitoids, and predators. The first two are are both beneficial, uh, pollinators and beneficials. Both of all these? I say all of them. Okay. I'm gonna show you a couple more pictures. That first photo was an aphid and a ladybug or ladybird beagle, beetle. Here you have a praying mantis, a lacewing, and some caterpillars with eggs. I take that back. These are beneficials is what you would refer to as beneficials? Um, actually, they're both. So each of these photos have one bad bug and one good bug. I'll roll it back for you. Or the middle one has two good bugs. So here, your ladybird beetle will actually eat the aphid, which is on top. And the aphid will eat your plants. You might see them often if you go out and check your vegetables, maybe some greens or some broccoli, and you'll see these little spots like covering the stem or the leaves underneath the leaves. Um, they could be white, they could be brown. Some aphids are like red, um, but those will obliterate your plants. So 
the ladybird, ladybugs actually will eat aphids. So in this photo, the aphid is the bad bug and the ladybug is the good bug. In this photo, you have praying mantis and lacewings. Lacewings eat like nectar and pollen, but their um, babies actually eat the eggs that are on the bottom here, caterpillar eggs, um, which turn into caterpillars, which then tear holes into most of your greens. Um, and you may see like, other caterpillars eat some of your other um, produce as well. And then here, this is actually a trichogramma wasp, which is a parasitoid. And what it will do is the um, in its larvae stage, it will um, parasitize the eggs of the caterpillar and kind of eat them um, until they're gone. <laughs> um, so yes. Beneficials, pollinators, parasitoids, and predators. Uh, wait, don't kill that bug. Pollinator refers to an insect that travels from flower, transferring pollen, which is necessary for plants to fruit or seed. Some examples of these are bees, birds, and butterflies, as you see here. A parasitoid is an organism that takes over a host, in this case, an egg or an insect, and it feeds off of it. An example is the parasitic wasp. A predator is a beneficial insect that hunts and consumes the insects that consume your crops. Some examples of these are the ladybird beetle, beetle the lacewing, and praying mantis. Also consider carnivorous plants and birds like chickens, which can be in a very inexpensive and effective way to feed your chickens, and to give them a more diverse diet while controlling the insects in your garden. Pollinators are particularly attractive to pollinator insects. I mean, pollinator insects are particularly attracted to pollinator plants, um, which you can learn more about at our next workshop, 99 Problems, But a Pest Ain't One. Some examples of pollinator plants are chamomile, alyssum, rosemary, lavender, and native yarrow. All right, time for you guys to give me some feedback. Would you rather have a big bowl of ice cream? It doesn't have to be the vanilla ice cream with sprinkles. It could be your favorite ice cream. It could be non-dairy ice cream or a bowl of salad, veggies. Anyone can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just say salad or ice cream. Salad. Salad. Y'all are some salad folks. I love and appreciate that. Salad is great for you. You all must know the benefits of salad over ice cream. Right. But if I were to ask, say, a child, not a special child that loves salad, but the majority of children, they would say ice cream, I'm sure. I, I mean, I'm just guessing, but I, that's my guess. So I'll talk about that more in just one second. Sacrificial plants are grown specifically for the benefit of other plants or for the soil, such as trap, crop, trap crops. Trap crops or decoy plants are plants that attract harmful insects away from your main crops. Sometimes a trap crop is the same crop planted in succession. So it's time so that insects will go for the first crop and then you can dispose of the crop along with the insects hopefully right before your other crop harvest, is ready for harvest. Sometimes uh, the trap crop is a different type of crop, one that's more attractive to the type of uh, insect, the harmful insect that you have growing, coming into your garden. Uh, hence the analogy ice cream or veggies. So the idea of trap cropping is to put something more attractive nearby as a decoy to draw the pests to that or to the draw the insects to the decoy plant and for them to leave your main crops alone. Different insects are attracted to different trap crops. So observation is gonna be your best, best tool for determining what trap crops to plant and where in your specific garden. 
Some trap crops are planted around the main crop, like a barrier or a wall. Some are planted interspersed with the main crop, and some work well when they're just somewhere close by. Trap cropping is more efficient when it's coupled with companion planting for attracting beneficial predatory insects who consume the insects that consume your crops which you'll hear more about again in our workshop next, um, our next workshop in two weeks, 99 problems, but a pest ain't one. Some examples of trap crops include nasturtium, which you see here, as well as nettles and mustard. Alternatively, some decoy plants work by scent masking, having such a strong aroma that it blocks out the scent of other crops, such as rosemary, which should be planted upwind from fruit trees. Or some might have such a strong aroma that they act as repellents to some insects, such as wormwood, medicinal, and lemon, which should be planted under grapes. Uh, I heard a couple of people say they're growing some grapes. So you, um, if you don't have any lemon geranium growing under there, you might consider it. Or if you have some fruit trees, you might consider throwing some rosemary upwind. There is another type of sacrificial plant mentioned briefly when I talked about soil plant. Um, it, it could also be referring to the chop and drop plant. These plants are grown specifically for their biomass accumulating abilities. Um, they're often grown and cut down repeatedly, essentially being farmed for the nutrients that they provide to the soil and to, to the plants that they're, um, that they are, or the plants that you put the mulch on. Um, these pioneer support trees and um, hardy plants actually um, should grow back on their own. And while half of the system is still in there, the root system is still in the ground, it will continue to provide nutrients, pumping them deep into the soil. Are there any questions at this point? I did have a question. Yes. Um, I know you were talking about trap crops. Um, we had tried um, marigold to like ward off aphids. I know you said you're gonna get more into that uh, next week. But is that a good one or? Yes, okay. marigolds are a, are off a couple of different things. Um, I had a section where I was talking about it here, but then it gets really deep into the bug part. And I really wanted to save that for next week, but for sure marigolds are an amazing way um, to try to trap um, different types of insects that will eat your plants. Okay, thank you. Of course. So on these photos, you'll see the nasturtium, you'll see some mustard, which also attracts bees. In the middle, you see two rows. These are actually um, crops that were cut down and they're gonna be used um, for either composting or for mulching. Um, and then in the right-hand side, you see a mint plant, which is actually, it's actually a sage plant, excuse me. And that sage plant is infested um, and it's, a decoy. And then underneath that, you'll see another decoy planted nearby, which is uh, meant to ward or to trap or to attract the pests or harmful insects. I really want to change my words and not use the word pest um, because a lot of things come with what you say and, and your words hold power. So um, they're just insects and what they do to live, which is eating, but they're eating your crops. So um, yes. Will this go? Perfect. All right. So Three Sisters um, is actually a really good planting. Um, has anyone ever heard of Three Sisters companion planting before? Or attempted it? Yes, beans, like beans, corn, uh, or it would be like squash, corn. Uh, uh, yes. I'm missing on the last one, but I hope you guys understand. <laughs> No, you had it. Perfect. Thank you. That is it. So it's squash, um, which that is like a wide variety of different types of squashes, um, pumpkins and things of the like. And then beans, which also gives you a wide variety of types of beans. Also peas, because they do pretty much the same thing. Um, they're legume this nitrogen fixing type vining plants and then the corn. Um, so the idea with the three sisters companion planting is you have the tall, strong, vertical growing corn, which is a nitrogen consuming plant. It loves nitrogen. It loves to just eat it up. 
Then you have the vining mid-level nitrogen uh, fixing leguminous bean plants, which love to vine up the corn stalks and it puts the nitri nitrogen back into the soil that the corn likes to take up. Then you have creeping ground level. They're also, they're creeping, but they're also like vining, depending on how you do with support. Um, but they're pollinators. Basically your squash plants get these beautiful flowers that attract your pollinators. And the pollinators come, which help your squash and beans to grow better. They're not necessarily needed for pollinating your corn because your corn is pollinated by wind and by the hairs on the top touching where a bird flies by and hits it, then, I mean, the hairs are going to touch it. So it kind of will help also. Um, so here you'll also see just a couple other examples of great paired companions. Um, but for more, for a more extensive list of companion planting, you can check out the Old Farmer's Almanac um, Companion Planting Guide. You can check out your local Local master gardeners. Um, there are actually a few master gardeners in our community who you can talk to, Brother Sawazi, Brother uh, Ian. There's a few uh, people who are doing different things in organizations that have to do with companion planting. So you can definitely talk to them about companion planting guides. Um, and then this last picture is just a beautiful picture uh, my sister found for me of some companion plants you don't usually see together. Um, and I just thought that this was so amazing. They have sugar cane growing, they have avocado, papaya, they have trees mixed in with vining plants, some ground cover like sweet potatoes. Um, so I just thought that was just really beautiful. And that's all for the for this workshop. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your time, for your patience with my numerous tech problems. <laughs> um, please make sure to join us for our next workshop in the mini series. It's uh, the title is 99 problems, but a pest ain't one. And let's continue to use what we got to grow what we want. If there's any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can drop it in the chat and we will go through the chat. Um, we still have just a few minutes, so there's more than enough time if you if y'all have questions and I have a question. I, yes, I put it actually, I put it in the chat, but we had tried buying ladybugs to eat the aphids, put them out and it flew away. We tried praying mantises, they worked for a while and then they ran away. So how do you, if you get them, how do you keep them? That's a great question. Um, I actually had that happen to me before as well. I thought it was so cute to buy them and have my children come out with me to the garden and and like have this whole conversation about the circle of life. But uh, the bugs, so ideally, we don't want to trap them anyways, right? Because that's kind of sad to just say, hey, you're constricted to my garden and you have to work for whatever food that is here. <laughs> so um there, there, there's going to be some that will just leave. But the idea is if we can add more stuff into our garden through the use of companion planting, we can give them more to stay for. And we can try to provide like habitats that are more comfortable for them um, so that they want to stay, right? Like, uh, so maybe you can check out a couple of, uh, we, we talked about a couple now, but we'll also We'll talk about a couple next week, but you can check out certain plants that actually like provide habitat for ladybugs. Um, you can check out certain plants that really, really attract them. Salvia, there's a, there's a number of plants. Um, and then like when you release them, you got to give them a place to want to stay. And then hopefully it will attract others like around as well. I hope that answers your question. It's not like a for sure thing just because at the end of the day they're, they're bugs and they don't listen to humans <laughs> but um you know if, if we could tell them please stay in my garden i would tell all the beneficials to stay and all the harmful ones to go all right thank you of course if you miss a program is there a way to uh still catch it like a are you you recording this like a a um you know, through the computer, you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for asking that. So 
I've been trying to work on just the, uh, like, I'm not really tech savvy, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm bad with technology. So I am going to work with uh, my sister and with Joseph Sandy Gito to try to send out the Zooms. So if you can, please go into the registration form and make sure we have your email so that we can email out those, um, the video from the last week. And if you end up meet, uh, missing any other workshops um, between the next, for the next three. Where's okay. the registration form or located? I'm going to, um, my sister's actually going to drop the link in the chat here. Um, and then I can also send um, an email if you, if you have to, um, if you don't already have the registration link, please add your email into the chat. We'll copy the email, add it to our list, and then make sure that you get um, our update with the registration link after this. Sartika, this is Laura. I have a question. Um, how much room do you need for this, the three sisters type planting? Can, are, is, are they like kind of crowded in together on top of each other and they, they just kind of make their own space? Um, I'm trying to visualize how I can kind of change things for this next winter slash summer crop. Definitely. And thank you for asking that question as well, um, because that is a main part with like food forest design and like with the three sisters and companion planting. Um, and I talked about it briefly in our previous um, workshop, which if you check out the recording later, you'll see um, and we'll work on kind of fleshing that out more as well. But the idea of companion planting is so that you can save space. And so it, you're stacking in space and time. So like with the three sisters example, for, uh, for example, because you signed, saw the picture, the corn yeah. grows tall. And so it's already in this top level, it's, you know, getting its sun. And then you have beans, the beans, they can grow tall because they'll vine up the corn stalks, but usually they're about mid-level. Um, and below. And then you have the squash, which is vining um, and creeping, but it's more creeping than vining if you don't provide upward support for it to go up. It's not going to do what a bean does. The bean is strange. I mean, it's awesome. It's really great. It has this little suction and it will just like quarrel around anything it can get its hand on and suction its way up. The, yeah. the squash and stuff, they'll do that. Um, but what I seen in my three sisters plot is they were more likely to spread out across. And so you get three layers in essentially the same box. Wow. When I did mine, I did it in, um, I think it's a five by 10 raised bed. Um, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, but there are companion plant systems that you can do in much smaller space. Um, for instance, like nasturtiums, which you can put in a pot, which will keep them contained. And you can plant them nearby um, a bunch of different things, like in pots, and just have them close enough by. That's not going to work for your nitrogen fixers because you want them ideally in the same soil because that's what they do is put back into the soil. But if it's for pest control, I mean, uh, insect control, or for pollination reasons, they can be close by in small pots. Um, with the corn specifically, you need just a little space because you do need to have a few uh, corn plants so that they can pollinate themselves. When I first did that, I planted three, I think, and they, they were too far apart. They weren't able to pollinate, cross-pollinate. So I got these like corn ears and there was a beautiful blue heirloom corn and some of the kernels were gone. And I'm like, somebody got into my thing and ate some kernels. And then I was like, wait, they're still closed in the husks and everything. So that must have just been how they grew. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. And I love the idea of not having to weed as much. <laughs> yes, the idea of not having to weed as much is not only great for labor wise, but it's also great for our soil. Um, when we'll get into a discussion about regenerative practices, our soil is much better when we're not pulling and um, like tilling and things of that sort. The microorganisms get um, much more opportunity to to like reproduce themselves and to establish themselves. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I've can I unmute now and have a nice evening? Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.
Bye. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining. If anyone else has questions, I'll stay on. If you don't have questions and you have to go, I totally understand and I appreciate you for your time. Um, but I will be here if you do have questions. Um, and you can also email us. We appreciate you all. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and I'm, and I'm here. In the past, we had a exterminator come in and we poisoned the soil, basically. I haven't, that's, that was a couple of years ago. So I don't know if my soil is, is okay to plant crops that you can eat. Question. <clears throat> and there's some things that you can possibly look into in terms of bioremediation. And like, I know that I watched some videos on, um, mushrooms and on how they change the soil. So there was like this truck yard and there was so much pollution in this dirt and the the soil actually was like devoid of all moisture, nutrients, uh, growing material, organic material. So it ended up being like a dirt lot, right? A picture, some of the dirt lots you see out in these desertified areas, uh, just brown, dirt like you, you don't even call it soil um and what um i have to remember the gentleman's name who did the it was a test but they started putting mushrooms growing mushrooms in this field and the mushrooms actually consumed the toxins and chemicals and then turned them back into nutrients and re like started to build new ecosystems inside the soil so there are things that you can do um in terms of and in terms of trying to um, to turn back those those times to make it so that your soil isn't toxic um, to your plants. Um, if you want to email me, I will definitely um, get the name of the guy who did that. Sunflowers, good. Thank you so much for that. Yes, sunflowers. They said did that too, and they actually planted these rows of sunflowers, and it was just putting back so much. Like a sunflower, I think they said. The sunflower, what you see on the top is like about what you see on the bottom, if not less. Um, so there's totally a bunch of different ways to fix the soil. Um, I know they say like, oh, the desert desertification of the earth and like all these different things we've gone so far, there's no fixing it. But um, actually through regenerative practices, there are so many ways that within a short period of time, we can actually reverse all the damage that's been done. Um, like to our earth, uh, Josh, there's a gentleman by the name of Josh who does a San Diego um, Sustainability Institute. And what he was saying um, before is that, I think the research shows if the entire world, like all the earth, if we can increase the soil about one inch that it would uh, completely reverse all of the damage done to the earth since the indus industrial revolution. So that's like really, I mean, the whole world, that's huge, yes, but like an inch of animal, like we could do that by, uh, you know, planting nitrogen fixing crops, planting more carbon sequestering crops, making sure there's more cover crops. Um, I know in San Diego, I, I'm just to go off a quick tangent, like I heard on the radio, you know, the stuff with trying to conserve the water here and that there's more fines that are coming on if you water your plants or, you, you know, you wash your car. I um, mean, so the radio host said, well, lots more people are going to be getting turf. And I said, please, no, because the turf is actually anti what we're trying to do. We're trying to plant cover crops and trees that build into the soil. The cover mm -hmm. crops keep the moisture in our soil. Um, which actually reverses the process of desertification. So uh, no turf, no asphalt, no more sidewalks. Let's like plant some crops and plant some cover uh, plants, you know, clovers or um, alfalfa even. And um, so we, there's ways that we can reverse what's done um, into the soil and to the land. And uh, also just to add on to that, uh, in terms of herbicide, you can, there's a couple of things you can do. You can uh, just plant a, a crop of just grass for, cause grass grows really fast, really quick and they're just gonna absorb most of the nutrients there. So if you plant a couple crops of grass and then start all over and then start with you know, new fresh plants, plants will absorb the herbicide. And as well as like charcoal, 
Uh, if you mix in ac activated charcoal into your, your soil, it'll do that too, or some biochar. Biochar is a good, uh, another, another good alternate to help kind of bind the herbicide. That's what I was going to say too, biochar. Yeah. I learned how to make the biochar. Biochar is easy. Biochar does wonders for your soil. It just provides new, it binds the bad things and uh, just creates carbon for the plants to absorb. And you can actually do a bonfire with friends if you watch the fire, burn it hot, burn it safely, mm -hmm. please. Um, and get in your producing your biochar with a, a little hangout, you know? Yeah, so, so yeah, that's an easy way to just create biochar. Just have a little, you know, little fire pit and then mix that with your soil when it when you're done. Yeah, and if you're not a fan of having plants and those types of things, like um, Joseph was saying, you can plant grass. Grass gets deep roots too, and they do a lot for the soil. And then you can just mow it. And when you mow it, it keeps growing back. Um, but you can actually donate your mow clippings or your lawn clippings to somebody who does compost. That's an awesome way to give back and to reduce your waste. Any other questions? All right, well, I appreciate each and every one of you again for your time, just for joining us tonight. If you have questions after this, please feel free to email me. You can hit me up on social media, um, email Fat Crops website, I mean, Fat Crops email, which is Fat Crops, P-H-A-T-S-C-R-O-P-S-S-D, Fat Crops San Diego. Um, and I will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And then please join us in two weeks on February 1st for the next workshop, 99 Problems, But a Pest Ain't One. All right, y'all. Peace. Good night. Thank you so much.